السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله In the name of Allah most gracious most merciful um, My dear brothers and sisters uh, welcome to the continuation of the Islamic education series and inshallah today we begin a new topic we finished the topic of al-hijra uh, over the past uh, several weeks and now we are going to begin a new topic and the topic that we're going to talk about is jihad and uh, i want to spend just a few minutes about why this topic because uh, jihad is uh, an integral part of islam and an important um, concept in Islam, but unfortunately, uh, really in the past 19 years, since the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, jihad has taken a very negative connotation. And uh, in the minds of many, it has come to be equal to terrorism, to violence, to hatred, which the truth of the matter is nothing could be further from, from that notion, even amongst Muslims. And that's really the tragedy is that Muslims themselves know very little about jihad. Uh, education about jihad, knowledge about jihad has been declining over the past 19 years in a very serious manner. Uh, some of it is deliberate, some of it is circumstantial. Uh, if you go to a masjid today, anywhere in the Muslim world, or even in the non-Muslim world, and you listen to a khutbah, uh, it is extremely rare that you will hear one about jihad. Um, most imams avoid the topic, uh, either because they don't want to be persecuted or taken out of context or misquoted or misinterpreted, and rightfully so, because many of them have been. Uh, or they just feel it's not enough time, that the topic of jihad requires an in-depth analysis and, and explanation and study, and that a 20-30 minute khutbah really cannot accomplish that task. And so uh, we felt that this is an important topic for us to discuss in these uh, sessions and that we have a little bit more time because every two weeks we will have a session inshallah and uh, we try to make it about 50 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, and then time for questions. And we try to wrap it all up in about an hour. Uh, so today's the, the first one. And um, before we discuss uh, jihad, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, some of the sources that I am using. So first of all, um, this discussion is not gonna be my opinion. I mean, there are some instances in future talks here uh, in, this, in this series where I will express my opinion, but if I do, I will tell you that it's my opinion. But if I don't tell you it's my opinion, I want you to be assured that it isn't. It's information that I obtained from reliable sources. And there are multiple uh, sources on jihad and, and multiple writings both uh, ancient and old and uh, more modern uh, writings about jihad. Um, I will note uh, a couple of uh, books that I uh, have used to uh, formulate these talks. Uh, one is uh, Al-Jihad fil Quran. Uh, it's a book about jihad from the Quranic perspective and it details an analysis of the ayat of jihad in the Quran. Um, I also, of course, uh, refer to the Quran itself and to the Hadith, the Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and other books of Hadith. Um, but uh, perhaps the most important resource that I will be using is an encyclopedic work by uh, uh, Dr. Yusuf al-Qaradawi, where he wrote a book entitled Fiqh al-Jihad. He had written several encyclopedias like this in the past. He wrote one about zakah called Fiqh al-Zakah. Uh, and he wrote uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Fiqh al-Jihad. Uh, it is two volumes. In total, it's about 1,600 pages. That's how extensive it is. And he discusses everything you ever wanted to know about jihad and more 
and we will be using that as a reference uh, text, inshallah. Uh, by the way, uh, Fiqh al-Jihad is available for free. It's on the internet. You can download it as a PDF. It's a very large file, uh, so you don't really want to print it. It's 1,600 pages. It's very difficult to print. But uh, certainly you can uh, download it onto a device and look at it and, and, and browse through it. Uh, it has a very nice index. It's in the Arabic language. Uh, I could not find an English translation, so I assume it has not been translated yet. Uh, so if you know Arabic, then that will be uh, a resource you could tap into. If you don't, then it may not be the best uh, book to look at. Now, before we talk about jihad, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, defining some terms, because this um, topic of jihad has a lot of terms associated with it that we often don't understand, or at least do not interpret properly. And we are going to start with the word jihad. What does it really mean? Uh, it is an Arabic word, and it is derived from the Arabic root uh, jahada or juhd. And uh, those are three-letter words that have two different meanings, but um, one meaning is to exert effort. And the other meaning is to exert effort for a goal. So you exert an effort to try to reach a goal. Now this effort doesn't have to be physical effort. It can be mental effort, it can be psychological effort, it can be financial effort, any effort that leads you to a goal. Now in terms of the Islamic meaning of jihad, um, many uh, scholars of the past and the present and many Muslims equate jihad with fighting, with warfare, with um, a battle between people or between groups. And that's only one meaning of jihad. And we will be delving uh, into that in more detail. But this word jihad is often used to delineate that. And in the Quran, it's also used that way as well. But it is also used to define other types of jihad. Now, the word jihad and its derivatives are mentioned in the Quran 34 times. 34 times. Now, the interesting thing about the word jihad, which many people don't know, is that many of those mentionings of the word jihad were in Mecca surahs. So they were in surahs revealed in Mecca. Now, you have to understand, and I think we talked about this uh, during the Hijrah series, is that actual warfare and fighting, taking up arms to defend Islam, was not required of Muslims until after the Hijrah. So when the Muslims were in Mecca, in the Mecca phase of Islam, they were not required to resist uh, in an armed resistance. Yet we see that the word jihad, jahadu, jahidu, jihadihi, all these words appear in the Quran in many Mecca surahs. And from that, the scholars of Quran have said that the word jihad cannot really be used to only mean fighting, that it includes other types of struggle, other types, types of effort. For example, if someone is persecuted and oppressed and they are patient, that is a jihad. If someone resists with their tongue, so they, they stand up and say something, as for example, Sayyidina Umar did in Mecca, that's a form of jihad. If someone simply uses the Quran to make an argument, to convince someone or to rebuttal someone who's attacking Islam, that's considered a jihad. So the scholars concluded from this word jihad and its derivatives and the way it appears in the Quran that it's not simply fighting, that it encompasses a lot more than that. And we will go into some of the detail as we move along in this effort. The second word that I want to um, talk about is the word, the Arabic word, qital. Qital. Um, the best or closest English translation of the word qital is fighting. Now, qital is a little bit different than jihad. It is a form of jihad, but it's not jihad in its entirety, as I just mentioned earlier. 
Um, and really what it means is actual a fight between two people or two groups. In other words, there have to be two parties to the fight. It can't be just one person fighting on their own. There, have to be, there has to be someone else. Uh, although uh, there are many types of qital where one party is stronger than the other party, the other party is weak. So there isn't an actual fight, there's actual oppression where someone's actually just killing the other party or harming the other party or maiming the other party. Now the word qital appears in the Quran 67 times, almost twice as often as the word jihad. And when it appears in the Quran, it is talking about a fight. And it's defining the rules of the fight. And so we will be talking about that uh, extensively because they are important. And it's important to also know that the word qital and fighting is not always noble. That sometimes it can indicate a bad fight or a fight that is not Islamic a fight that goes against the rules of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ used this in a hadith himself. He said, If two Muslims meet each other with their swords, that is two Muslims fighting each other, and he used the word fighting, then the person who kills and the person who is killed are both destined to the hellfire, which means that this killing has no nobility to it. It is un-Islamic and it's a violation of the teachings of Islam. So that's one example. The word doesn't always mean that it is a noble cause or that it is being done in an Islamic fashion or in accordance with the Islamic rules of jihad. So it's important to understand what that word qital really means. The third word that I want to discuss with you is the word harb. Harb is an Arabic word and it means war. Now harb is a little bit different than qital because it doesn't necessarily mean armed conflict. You can have warfare, for example, you can have cyber warfare. You can have financial warfare. You don't have to have people actually killing each other on a battlefield. So it's a little bit broader term it's a term that Islam does not like to use. The Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi in a hadith, he said, do not name your son Harb. The Arabs, many of them used to name their sons Harb to indicate that it was someone strong who can fight and battle. So they would call him Harb. And the Prophet warns, he said, that's not a good name. Don't use the name Harb. Harb was mentioned in the Quran six times or its derivatives. And all six times it was not mentioned in a good way. Uh, in fact, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was denouncing warfare in, in all, uh, all of those uh, six uh, instances where it is uh, mentioned uh, in the Quran. Um, uh, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing, um, he's talking about, about the Jews and, and how they started a war and he said, And every time they light the fire of war, Allah will extinguish it. And then he said, and they seek nothing but mischief on earth. So war is bad. It is to create mischief on earth. And it's not something that Muslims necessarily want to or like to engage in. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he used the word qital, but in reference to a war. He said, Kutiba alaykum al qitalu wa huwa kurhun lakum. Warfare has been prescribed upon you in certain circumstances, and we'll discuss that, and you don't like to do it. So most Muslims don't like to actually engage in warfare, at least they shouldn't. Uh, unfortunately, some do, and we will be talking about that uh, as we move along. The next word, and I have only two more words to discuss, but the next word that I want to discuss with you is the word unf. The word unf uh, is an Arabic word and the best translation for it is uh, violence, violence. And the word unf is not mentioned in the Quran. It is mentioned uh, in the Hadith, 
uh, in which uh, the Prophet Sallallahu again, uh, he basically told us that, that as Muslims, as believers, and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala himself does not like violence. Uh, he said, uh, إِنَّ اللَّهَ رَفِيقٌ يُحِبُّ الرِّفْقِ وَيُعْطِي عَلَى الرِّفْقِ مَا لَا يُعْطِي عَلَى الْعُنْفِ uh, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is kind and gentle and he loves gentleness. And Allah rewards for gentleness what he does not give for violence. So violence is something that we as believers really do not look, look forward to at all and do not engage in and do not like. Yet Islam has been labeled as a violent religion. In fact, non-Muslims have accused Islam of teaching violence, of inciting violence, of driving its followers to engage in violence. Somehow, and this is depicted a lot in Hollywood where someone becomes a Muslim and suddenly they become a terrorist. Some, suddenly they start killing people. Just like that. They just accepted Islam. Two days later, they're fighting a battle. Uh, very unrealistic, but that's the depiction. That, that's what has become. And uh, it's a really sad, uh, sad statement. In fact, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't use the word unf in Quran, but he uses other words uh, to describe a situation similar uh, to unf. For example, he says, And your hearts hardened after that. And it became like stones or even more hardened than stones. So this is a description really of someone who's very violent, who has no gentleness or kindness in their heart. They're just so harsh. They're as harsh as a stone or as hardened as a stone or even more so. So the word unf does not appear in the Quran and it is not something that Muslims like to engage in. The last word uh, in terms of definitions that I want to share with you is the word uh, irhab. And it is a word, the English translation of it, of course, the Arabic word irhab is a translation of the or English word terror and terrorism. And it's really about fear. And the true Arabic word for terror and terrorism is not really irhab, it's actually a mistranslation. The scholars of language have said that the correct word is tarwir. Tarwir is really the word that, that if you look at historical books, that's the word people have used to describe those who engage in terrorism, which mean, mainly means performing acts of violence to scare people, to instill fear in their heart. And that may include killing innocent people, but sometimes it doesn't include killing people. It includes destroying property or creating a big show, whatever it may be, to instill fear in the hearts of people. Now, the word irhab does not appear in the Quran except in one instance. And the word that's used is turhibuna. And it really doesn't have anything to do with terrorism. So it's a completely different meaning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, And prepare for them whatever you're capable of in terms of strength and horses, and so that you may use that to deter the enemies of Allah and your enemies. So the word turhibuna in this ayah is really used to describe a situation where Muslims are asked to strengthen themselves so that they can deter an attack by their enemies. That's really the idea. So it's not going and, and, and instilling fear in the hearts of others. No, that's not the idea. But the idea is to be prepared in case you're attacked. And that way this preparation will deter those who want to attack Muslims from attacking them. Now the opposite of terror and fear is uh, peace and tranquility and security. And Islam talks about that extensively. And he, in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that he's the one who bestows security upon people. He talks about Quraysh, where he provided security for them after they became fearful. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And he will replace after they've been fearful, peace and security. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides 
that opposite. In fact, it is the label of a Muslim to provide security. If people are fearful of a Muslim, then there's a question about their faith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Mu'minu man aminahu nas ala dima'ihim wa amwalihim. The believer is the one who people feel safe about him when it comes to their own lives and to their property. So if someone sees you as scary, as you trying to attack them and kill them or take their property, then there's a question about your faith. Because the Prophet said the definition of the faithful is someone who people feel comfortable around, who feels safe, who feels secure to be around that person, which is the exact opposite of terror and fear uh, and terrorism. So uh, I want to stop there in terms of the definition of the words. Um, there may be other words that we'll define later, but I, I chose those five words because I thought they were important. And uh, it's important that we understand what we're talking about. Uh, and one of the important ways to understand what we're going to be talking about is to understand the words that we will be using. And we will be referring to these words as we, as we move along. Now, jihad, uh, unfortunately, uh, has become, uh, there's been an attitude that has developed amongst Muslims towards jihad. And it spans two extremes, with very few people in the middle, which is really sad. One extreme is complete fear of the word jihad. Many Muslims, they hear the word jihad, they cringe. They cringe. In fact, uh, I'll just share with you some examples. I, I was talking to a, a relative of mine, he lives in, a, in another uh, state, and I was telling him that I'm going to be, inshallah, doing a series about jihad. And, 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 and the funny thing is we were talking on the phone and immediately his, his voice uh, volume decreased like to half. He said, what? What are you going to be talking? I said, I'm going to be doing a series about jihad. He said, no, no, no. Why do you want to do that? I said, well, because we want to learn. I mean, we're Muslims. We don't want to learn about jihad from CNN. We want to learn about from our authentic sources. We want to learn what it really means. And he was in a low voice. He was afraid. And he was at his house. I mean, he wasn't, you know, in a public place. And he said, no, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Someone's going to take your words out of context. The FBI is going to be listening in. I said, you know, I, I, I wish they would listen. I mean, they probably don't want to spend the time, but I wish they would listen to this. Because we are going to define and we're going to talk about jihad from the Islamic perspective, the proper way, what it really is. We're not going to talk about crazy things. Okay, that's not the point. If you want crazy things, go find crazy people. But that's not what we're going to be talking about. But that example that I just share with you, shared with you about my relative exemplifies one extreme, which is real fear of jihad. Nobody wants to talk about it. They don't want to mention it. In fact, they would rather even forget about the ayat in the Quran that refer to jihad. They would just wish they didn't exist. And when they read them, I can even tell sometimes in taraweeh, when the imam is reading them, everyone gets a little bit anxious. Let's just go on. Let's move on. Uh, it's, it's really sad. I mean, it is truly, truly sad. And by the way, there are beautiful ayat in the Quran. They have such valuable meaning. And we're going we're gonna to touch on that in this series, inshallah. But in any event, that's what's happened. And I don't blame Muslims on that extreme. Because they haven't had the opportunity to learn. They haven't had exposure. They hadn't had the proper knowledge of what it means. It's not their fault. The Muslim establishment have, uh, have, have actually just ignored teaching about jihad. So nobody knows. So you can't blame people who haven't been taught that they don't know. You can't blame them. And, and that's what's happened. Now there's another extreme of jihad which is people who look at jihad as only qital, people who look at jihad as only a fight. And they twist and turn the ayat, and they twist and turn the hadith to justify anything. The killing of innocent people, suicide bombing, you name it. Whatever it may be, they will justify whatever comes to mind. Any kind of violence. 
and it's the outer extreme. And not only that, but anyone who doesn't agree with them, they will attack. So you have two extremes. They're both upset at each other. They both can't stand each other and they're both wrong. And that is really the sad reality of the Muslim Ummah vis-a-vis Jihad. And that's an integral reason why I felt this was an important topic for us to talk about and for us to uh, discuss. Now, scholars have uh, written extensively about what is Jihad? What is it really? I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're saying it, 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 we define the word, but what does it really mean based on their analysis of the Quran and the Hadith? And, and there are different types uh, of jihad. And uh, inshallah, we're going to touch on that before the end of the talk today. That's going to be the last part of the, today's talk. Um, but some of the definitions, not the linguistic definition of the word jihad, but the true meaning of jihad in Islam is to expend an effort for the sake of protecting or spreading Islam. That's kind of a simple one-liner definition. So to expend an effort because jihad implies that there is an effort that's being put in, mainly to protect Islam. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but also to introduce and spread Islam. Now that effort doesn't always mean fighting. Fighting is one part of jihad. But that effort includes a lot of other things. And we're going to talk uh, about, about doing about some of those other things that are involved. Now, some of the scholars have actually delved into what kind of effort, like what are the different types of effort that a Muslim can put in that will define jihad. Some said it can be with your heart. So you simply have an intention to spread Islam to let people know about Islam. In your heart, you feel bad when Muslims are attacked or oppressed. You make a dua for them. So that is one form of jihad. Another form of jihad is to verbally defend Islam. So people will attack Islam, they will accuse it of this and that and have arguments against it and question it in a sinister way. And it's important for you to gain knowledge and understand how to respond to those who attack Islam. And that can be verbal, that can be in writing, whatever the forum may be, but there is a, a, a form of jihad which involves putting forth a good argument. That's how they define it. Another form of jihad is da'wah, to actually invite people to Islam, to actually present Islam and to explain Islam, and to be sincere and honest and genuine, to really do it so that people understand it with the hopes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them guidance and will steer them towards shahada and towards Islam. That is a form of jihad. Scholars said it is also a form of jihad to plan, to have good opinions, to protect Muslims and to help Muslims. That is a form of jihad. If you're someone who's wise or who have a certain level of experience in a certain aspect that can benefit the Muslim community or the Muslim nation, then you have an obligation to come forward and share that and to use it. There is jihad with oneself. That's kind of, you know, what does that mean? Uh, to actually expend your body, to go and fight. You know, there are enemies of Islam who are attacking Islam all the time but to actually fight those enemies. And that's what, we all, what many Muslims think of as jihad, actually going as a soldier and fighting. That is a form of jihad. Fighting financially, that's a form of jihad. You may not be able to go uh, in person, and we're gonna talk about some circumstances that may prevent you from doing that, but you can help those who need to go. They may not have the resources, they may not have the money, they may not have the means. They may not have the transportation. They may not have the know-how. They may not have the weapons, whatever it may be. You can help financially and participate in jihad. And in fact, this is mentioned in the Quran extensively. Now, the scholars define two types of jihad that involves resistance. So an armed struggle. So that type of jihad. 
And they say there are two types, and the two types are different and distinct. One type is what's called jihad al dafa That's defensive jihad. That is jihad to defend Muslims and Islam and Islamic lands. The other is jihad al talab and that's an offensive jihad. And you're gonna say, what is, you just go and, and start attacking people? No, there are a lot of rules and why Muslims would engage in an offensive jihad. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in uh, some of these talks that we come about. We're actually not a little bit, we're gonna talk a lot. But uh, just to give you an example uh, that some of the scholars have put forward as an offensive jihad or jihad al and that is, let's say that there is a non-Muslim nation and, and the Muslims know that that nation is plotting to destroy the Muslim nation, either financially or they're planning a war or they're arming themselves and, and planning an attack. And in the opinion of the Muslim um, uh, military leaders who have experience in fighting, they say, look, it's better that we do a preemptive attack on them before they attack us because we know it's imminent and it's going to happen. That's an example where it may be permissible and allowed to engage in that kind of attack to protect the greater good of Muslims and Muslim lands if they're going to be attacked imminently. That's an example of an offensive jihad. Another example of an offensive jihad is if somebody's being oppressed. Whether they're Muslim or not is not important, but if somebody is being oppressed and diplomacy and talking and, and financial pressure and whatever is not working, and these people are being oppressed and, and, and as Muslims, we have an obligation to defend the oppressed and to help the oppressed, that may be a situation where Muslims would be engaged in an offensive attack. And maybe not even by themselves. They may actually cooperate with some non-Muslims to try to lift this oppression and to stop this oppression. In that case, that kind of offensive jihad is permissible. So there are different circumstances where an offensive jihad is allowed. So those who say that jihad is only, only defensive are not accurate. And they're not really looking at all the circumstances that are possible. And they are limiting what Muslims can do by saying it's only a defensive jihad. It's not only a defensive. That is one, an important part of jihad, but there is also an offensive jihad, but both types of jihad are guided by certain rules and certain circumstances and certain, they, they, you can't just, oh, because I, I hate the other person, I'm gonna go attack, or I, we, we hate this nation, or, or they did something, you know, they said something bad, so we're gonna go kill them. No, that doesn't work like that. There has to be an imminent threat to Muslims. There has to be actual oppression happening. There has to be some real circumstance that in the opinion, not of me and you and simple individuals, but in the opinion of the Islamic leadership, that this needs to be warded off, that something needs to be done. Then if everyone agrees, then it's okay to part participate in an offensive jihad of that nature. And that's an important uh, delineation. Now, what is the Islamic ruling on jihad? Is it required? Is it obligatory? Is it recommended? Is it a sunnah? Is it a fard? What do these scholars say? There is extensive debate about this. Extensive. Hundreds of pages written about this issue with a lot of detail. But I'm going to summarize it for you. I'm going to make it simple. Uh, amongst the Sahaba, some of them felt that it was not required, that jihad was simply uh, what's in Arabic called nadb, it's just recommended. Others said it is a sunnah, because the Prophet ﷺ did it, then we should do it, but it's not required. Others say it is fard, fard ayn, that everyone is required to participate in jihad in some form or another. So it doesn't have to be fighting, but everyone is required. And others said, no, it's not fardu ayn, it's fardu kifaya. Fardu kifaya means that if some people do it, then the others don't. As long as the objectives of it are met. But if nobody does it when it is needed, then everyone is held accountable. That's what fardu kifaya means. 
that if it's required, if it's necessary, then a group of people have to participate and do it. And if they do, then the others are absolved of the responsibility. However, if nobody does it, then everyone is responsible and everyone will be held accountable for not doing it. This is the opinion of most scholars. And after extensive study, not by me, but by scholars of fiqh, they have come to the conclusion that al-jihad is fardu kifaya, that most people or people should participate, but not everyone has to participate, except under certain circumstances. So there are certain circumstances when jihad is obligatory, when everyone has to do it. For example, if Muslim lands are being attacked, those in that land have an obligation to defend that land. They can't say, for example, let's just take, for example, take a Muslim country, let's say Sudan. Let's say somebody attacks Sudan. Well, the people in Sudan who are Muslims have to defend Sudan. They can't say, well, it's fardu kifaya, let's wait for the Muslims from Myanmar to come and defend us. And we're just gonna sit back and do nothing. It's not required, no. If you're being attacked in your homeland, you have to defend. It is required. It is fardu ayn. That's an example of when jihad is obligatory. It's also obligatory if the Muslim leaders have come to the consensus that, it's, that everyone must participate in a jihad. Now that rarely happens, and in historically it has rarely happened. Most of the Muslim leaders, they, they, they have armies, and so the armies actually engage in jihad, and they fulfill the fardu kifaya. They don't require every single citizen in the Muslim nation to, to engage in jihad. But if they do, if they actually call upon every Muslim to participate, and sometimes that participation might be financial rather than actually yourself, then it is obligatory to do so. It becomes obligatory if you have a certain skill that the Muslim army needs to defend Islam or to defend the Muslim nation, and you are unique in your skill. Let's say you're a geographer and you have in-depth knowledge of the deserts and the mountains that nobody else in, the, in, the, in, the, in that location has, and they really need that to be able to be successful, then it's obligatory upon you, the geographer, to participate with your knowledge in jihad. That's an example where it is obligatory. Scholars also say it's obligatory if you happen to be present. So if you're there, let's say, you know, the example of Sudan, let's say you're not from Sudan, but you actually happen to be there, you're visiting on a, on a time when they're actually being attacked. So the battle is actually happening. Because you are present, then you're obligated to uh, fulfill the obligation that the Sudanese have to fulfill of defending their homeland. You would have to participate in that circumstance. So these are just a few of the examples that scholars have put forward when jihad becomes obligatory, which is fardu ayn. It's no longer fardu kifaya. Fardu kifaya is when some people can do it and others are absolved of the responsibility. But if nobody does it, everyone then is held responsible. Now, there are some requirements, okay? Not everyone can engage in the type of jihad that involves fighting and war and resistance and battle. There are some people who cannot. For example, someone who doesn't have the physical ability. So let's say somebody's paralyzed. How are they gonna fight a war? Now, that limitation, physical disability, depends on what's needed. Let's say that disabled person is really good with computers and they need that person to deal with the computer aspect or the IT aspect of a war, then they're, they're obligated to fulfill that obligation, even though they may have a physical limitation to actually go into battle. The, person, the people fighting have to have appropriate training. You don't just get go random people and say, let's go fight. That doesn't work. They have to be trained. So that's why the Muslim nations have developed armies. And this is even during the time of Rasulullah not just everybody fought. There was an army in the Battle of Badr, not the entire population of Medina who was Muslim went to fight in Badr. No, not all of the Muhajireen went to fight in Badr, but the select group who were actually trained in fighting. They are the ones who participated in that battle. 
And so they, there has to be some uh, training. You have to be able to actually reach the battlefield. So if you don't have a means of actually getting there, then uh, you don't have to go. The, the Prophet ﷺ, when he called to a battle and, and some young people came and they wanted to participate and they were poor, they didn't have an animal to ride to the battlefield and the Prophet ﷺ didn't have anything to give them. He said, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. You're not obligated to go. You can't, you don't have the means to get there. So if you don't have the means to get there, then uh, you don't have to go. If you're what we call an essential person in your own land. So let's say that you live, I don't know, in Syria and you wanna go and do jihad in, in uh, we, we talked about, we used Sudan as an example. You wanted to go do jihad in Sudan. They're being attacked, you wanna go help. But if you leave Syria, then there's gonna be harm done. And some examples, then you can't go, then you're not obligated to go. Some examples that the scholars have put forward is, let's say you, you, you attend to the sick. And if you leave, then those sick who you are gonna leave behind in Syria, they have nobody to attend to them. Or it's an elderly parent who needs your help and then you, you can't, you, you can't leave. You have to stay with the parent. Or if you're a soldier in Syria, you're defending Syria, and if the soldiers of Syria go to fight in Sudan, then someone might come and attack Syria, then you can't leave. So anything that, that puts your place in jeopardy where you're at, then you, you're not obligated to leave or to participate and you must stay put. So that's an important um, uh, aspect of the requirements of jihad, who can go? And what are the requirements for someone to actually uh, participate. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about today are what are called the levels of jihad or maratibul jihad. And it's an important discussion for us to talk about because it really tells us that the, the, the variety and how jihad is not just fighting a war and fighting a battle, that it's much more than that. Um, the best explanation of these levels of jihad comes from Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn al-Qayyim is a, is a uh, well-known scholar, and he has written uh, a, a large number of books. But in one of those books, he talks about jihad, and he probably really defines it the best of everyone. And his definition is still used today by scholars because it is very comprehensive and it's very, um, it makes sense. It's simple to understand. And he really defines uh, four levels of jihad. He said there are four different varieties of jihad. The first is jihad nafs the jihad against your own soul. See, that's very personal. Okay, this isn't fighting an enemy. This is fighting yourself. And he said, in that idea of fighting yourself, jihad nafs there are four important milestones you have to reach. You have to try to accomplish four things to meet that jihad of a nafs. The first thing is you have to struggle to learn. You have to learn about your faith. You can't just sit back and say, oh, I'm Muslim, but I don't really want to know how to pay zakah. I don't want to know how to do the calculation. No, you have to learn it. You have to struggle to learn. I don't want to be close to Allah. I don't want to learn how to do extra prayers. No. That's a struggle. You have to struggle to learn your faith. Then he says the second after that, after you've learned, then you have to act on what you learned. You can't just learn and keep it to yourself. You actually have to do something. Like you learn how to pay zakat, then you actually have to pay it. You learn how to do the prayer, actually pray. So not only do you learn, but you actually act upon what you learned. And then once you've done that, you have to teach others. So you have to take that learning you've got, you achieved and translate it into teaching others about it. And the fourth level, which is probably the hardest, is to have perseverance and patience. It's very difficult sometimes to stay on the right path, to stay on the right track. That's sometimes very difficult. Sometimes it's a struggle to fulfill the obligations. And he said, that is a level of jihad to fulfill those obligations. The second level of jihad that he talked about, so the first one is jihad al-nafs, jihad against your own soul. The second one is jihad al-shaytan, the jihad against the shaytan, against 
the shaitan. And he said there are two aspects to that. The first is to resist against the shaitan when he comes and he puts doubt in your mind. So the shaitan comes and says, oh, you know, don't pay sadaqah. Why do you have to pay sadaqah? You don't have to. You only have to do zakah. You don't have to pay sadaqah. Don't pay. Oh, there are other rich people who can pay. You don't have to pay. So come and put doubt. You want to do something good? And the, the shaitan comes and he puts doubt in your mind to help you hold back. That requires a struggle to fight that urge. The second resistance to the shaitan or the second type of jihad against the shaitan is to resist temptations. All we're human beings. We have the temptation. It can be something as simple as backbiting. There's a temptation for people to gossip. They kind of feel it's nice. The shaitan comes and it makes you feel good when you're talking about others because you somehow think you're better. You're talking about others. That means, oh, they're terrible. They're doing this and that and the other thing. That means I must be really good since I'm freely talking about them. So the shaitan comes and he gives you that temptation. And it could be bigger things. Shaitan comes and says, oh, drink some alcohol. It's good for you. It's good for the heart. He'll come and give you some example. Oh, it's okay. A little bit. It's not going to do anything. It's just a little bit. A sip. He comes and he tempts you with a little bit. Fighting that temptation is a form of jihad. The third level of jihad, and these are not in order, these are different types of jihad, is jihad al kuffari wal munafiqeen. Jihad against the non believers and the hypocrites. And here, he defines four types of jihad. He said, jihad with your heart. So you don't believe what they're saying. You feel bad that they're attacking Islam. So this is something, if you don't have that, that bad feeling in your heart, you're not really engaged in that kind of, of inner jihad against the non-believers and the hypocrites. The second is with your tongue. And he said that involves not just speaking, but also writing. You know, if they write things against Islam, you have to rebuttal them and write against them. If they speak against Islam, you defend Islam, you present the arguments. That is a form of jihad. He said jihad with your money. Because non-believers who are attacking Islam and Muslims want to repel that attack, it needs money, it needs resources. It's not going to happen for free. So some people have to participate with Money and money is not always just cash. I mean, sometimes it's it's actual physical things that people need for jihad. Maybe someone needs a car to get there. Maybe somebody needs a, a clothes, certain type of clothing to buy, or weapons, or whatever it may be necessary to fight the non-believers and the hypocrites. And the fourth aspect of that particular type of jihad is jihad of the person. That means you actually participate physically in a battle against the non-believers or the hypocrites who are trying to harm Islam. And the last and the fourth level of jihad, or the first, fourth type that Ibn al-Qayyim defines, is jihad against oppressors and transgressors. Jihad al-dhulm wa zalimin These are people who may not be living in the Muslim ummah. They may not be attacking the Muslims themselves, but they are oppressors. They're doing horrible things. And he said, one way is to physically stop the oppression, to actually go and try to stop that oppression. But sometimes you can't physically. He said, then say something. Speak against the oppression with your tongue. Do something. That's a form of jihad. And if you can't do either, at least in your heart, make a dua for the oppressed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them relief and rescue them from the oppression that they're facing. Um, I felt that, and, and many, not just me, many scholars use this delineation by Ibn al-Qayyim to really understand the expansive nature of jihad and how it involves so much and how it touches really many aspects of our life. You know, when you look at this, you suddenly realize that jihad and the opportunities for jihad are all around you. They're not just, you're not just sitting there waiting for the war to happen. No, there's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot, you yourself can jihad against your own self every single day, every single minute of every single day. Jihad against the shaitan, it happens to each and every one of us all the time. 
all the time. When people speak ill of Islam, say something. Just defend Islam. It's a beautiful um, and, and fairly simple explanation by Ibn al-Qayyim about jihad and what it really entails. And it's something that I think is worth our study and worth our reflection. Um, this brings me to the end of the first session. And inshallah, we will continue in two weeks uh, with, uh, with the next uh, session. Uh, and uh, we're gonna delve in, in more detail. Just to give you some idea, uh, we're gonna talk about um, jihad. Uh, this is not necessarily the next session, but over the next several sessions, we're gonna talk about the ayat in the Quran that address jihad and, and that address qital. We're gonna talk um, a little bit about some things related to jihad. For example, we're gonna talk about terrorism. We're gonna talk about suicide bombing. We're gonna talk about Islamophobia. That's part of jihad. We're gonna talk uh, about um, financial jihad and what's involved in that uh, and, and many other topics, but I will kind of leave you in suspense, if you will. Um, we're gonna talk about the role of women in jihad, um, just to give you a glimpse of, of some of the things that we're gonna to touch upon in this series, which will take several weeks, uh, several months actually, for us to, to complete. Uh, Jazakumullah khair, inshallah, I'll stop there and I will uh, take any questions uh, if, you, if you have them.